so alhamdulillah, congratulations, you all have completed the section on the ilahiyat or divinity and today or tonight we will begin the section on prophecy. We'll begin with the first of, I believe, if we go back to our map, at the very, very beginning, we have four attributes of prophecy which are the conditions uh, that make a person uh, or make someone uh, eligible for prophecy. And of course, we have an understanding that the prophets are all selected in the eternal knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the important thing that we have to rectify in our understanding about prophecy is that it's not a matter of choice. Okay, so to propose as some people, some modern Muslims are of an understanding that Allah looked amongst His creation and selected the best at the time, that entails that prophecy is something that someone can work toward or achieve through certain disciplines and activities and uh, regimens, which is of course false. All of the Prophets are selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, if you ever find a discussion that seems to imply that Allah looks, looked amongst His creation and found uh, the most suitable, and it was Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, so He istafahu, or selected him, take that in a metaphorical sense. Because there was never a time when Allah didn't know who the final Prophet would be. <coughs> In fact, the entire world was only created into existence from non-existence such that humankind worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ultimately that is sealed with the message of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. So it's as if from that perspective the entire world comes into existence for the sake of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. From that perspective because he is needed as a condition to fulfill the objective of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't know how to do that without the Prophet. And we have the principle of sacred law, which is la hukma qabla wurud shara. There is no judgment before legis uh, before we could say revelation or there is no judgment attached to a case until the law, sacred law is revealed. That would be a good way to translate it. There is no judgment attached to a case until the sacred law is revealed. Which returns us back to an important principle that Allah determines right from wrong. It is the Sunni belief that it is Allah that it determines right from wrong and good from evil and not the minds of men. Okay? We have a tendency to be drawn toward good and uh, be repelled by evil. That's part of the fitrah. But accountability to law and accountability to right from wrong only comes with the determination of Allah. Right. So if Allah had wanted to create a world in which those who disobeyed the sacred law were rewarded and those who obeyed the sacred law uh, were punished, uh, that would be possible because it is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created the entire universe and He sets all of the, uh, the terms, as it were. So going back to that, the khulasa, uh, in summary, there was never a time that Sayyidina Muhammad alayhi was not known by Allah to be the last and final prophet. 
The first of the conditions of true prophecy is truthfulness or siddhak. Right? Truthfulness or siddhak. The prophets deliver their message as they were meant to do and they are never untruthful. They never cover over the truth or try to divert people from the truth. Because if they were to do that, they would not be trusted when they're saying, right, there's a wolf coming. Right, so watch out. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ said that I am like the Nadir uh, al-Aryan, right, the naked warner. So in the pre, in the... In the times of Jahiliyyah, if there was a really, really emergency message that people had to get out, the messenger would come into a city, and this is the, the pre-Islamic Arabs. A person would come into the city, he'd strip naked and go to the highest point in the city, right? And make such a, uh, a hype that everyone would gather around to see what was so severe that this was happening. And the Prophet ﷺ said that he was like the Nadir al-Aryan. So, the person who comes to deliver a very critical message is known as the Nadir al-Aryan. Okay? So when someone uses that term, it doesn't mean that they are someone who strips naked in order to draw people's attention to their message. It just becomes now the title for anyone who comes with a very severe warning or a very critical uh, message. Like there is an army that is about to invade the city so everybody, you know, get out of your houses or something like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the truthfulness of the Prophet, مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى so, if he was this critical warner, and one of his names, and one of his epithets is the Nadir, okay, the one who warns, if he was not truthful, people couldn't depend on his warning. Your companion Muhammad is neither in error, nor is he deceived. مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَمْتَقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى Nor does he speak out of his own passion caprice or desire, alright, in huwa illa wahyuyuha, this is but revelation that is revealed, and the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, when he speaks, this is divine legislation, but it is not primary divine legislation, which is Quran, it is a secondary divine legislation. Okay, and that when he speaks, it is legislation. That's why it is critical that uh, the prof a prophet never says anything that is false. And at the same time, the speech of the prophet is guided by God. So if he says it, and it is a command, we, we understand it in the same way we understand a command from the Qur'an. So, we have the first way of verifying the truthfulness of a prophet is by looking at the miracles miracles that that prophet brings because a miracle is defined as a breaking of norms a miracle is a breaking of norms the word for miracle in Arabic is mu'jiza and the word mu'jiza literally means to disable, meaning that the miracle of the Prophet disables his opponents from doing the same thing. Any human being is unable or is disabled to do the same type of thing that this Prophet has done. 
okay? And this disablement, which is the mu'ajiza, right, which proves that other human beings, right, are not able to do what this Prophet has done, it is a breaking of the common norms in nature. So we're used to nature uh, functioning according to uh, a regulator, a regular system. The, 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 the planets uh, swim along in their orbit, all right? The sun turns on its axis, the seasons come and go, water flows downhill, right? And so on. One of the miracles of the Prophet, والسلام, of course, is mentioned in the Qur'an, اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَانْشَقَّ الْقَمَةُ right? So it is the cleaving of the moon in half. So, the miracle comes is a breaking of the norms that happens at the same moment that a person is claiming to be delivering a message from the creator of the universe. So the norms of the universe are broken in a way that no human being is able to bring about in the exact same moment that a person is claiming to be sent by the creator of the universe. So when he says, I am sent by God to tell you such and such and such and such, and the sign that I'm truthful in my claim is that God will now split the moon. All right? Now, whether it's said in that way, literally, explicitly in that manner, it doesn't matter. Or it just happens, and so it's as if when he's making a claim, I am sent by the creator of the universe to deliver this message, and all of a sudden the moon is split. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't have to know that the moon is about to be split, right? But while he's making these claims, people are being shocked at these incredible things happening which are not normal, all right? And it, as if, it is as if God has then verified the truthfulness of what this prophet has claimed. Because only God can split the moon. Only God can make water flow uphill, right? For example, naturally, of course. Um, I'm sure that someone will invent, invent a machine, right, at some point that will force water to flow uphill, uh, but it will be in a very controlled situation, usually involving electronics or something like that, and not uh, the natural course of the function of nature. It will be something very different. Um, so, for example, another example is that the Prophet ﷺ had an army to feed, and he was only given a small portion of food. He put his hand into the uh, plate of food and told the people to come eat. And everyone came and took as big a portion as they needed. And everyone was satiated. Uh, and uh, uh, that was another example. The water flowing from between his fingers. These are not normal things that happen in nature. So while someone is claiming to come from God and then these things happen, that only God can make happen, it's as if God has verified the claim of this person. Is that clear on the miracles? How it works? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَجْسُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُّبِينٍ In Surah Al-Jum'ah, he it is who is sent among the unlettered ones, a messenger of their own, or from themselves. Okay? So the Qur'an is the biggest mu'ajiza of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Tayyib. So, uh, and the Kufar are challenged um, to to bring something like the Qur'an, even of the size of the smallest surah, and this is something that hasn't, uh, that no honest judge has ex 
accept it. I mean, no honest person has uh, accepted that the Qur'an has been replicated to this day. And there are all types of uh, forms of i'jaz or miracle in the Qur'anic text. So that is something that is pointed toward in this verse. He it is who is sent among the unlettered people a messenger from their very selves. I mean, he also is someone who is not known to have the ability to read or write. But here he brings this text, the like of which has never been seen before. In another verse referring to the miracles of the Prophet والسلام, Allah says, Subhana Ladi Asra bi Abizihi Laylan Min al Masjid al Harami Id al Masjid al Aqsa Al Nadi Barakna Hawlahu Linuriahu Min Ayatina in Nahuwa Samil Wasir. Transcendent is he who carried his slave by night from the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque. And not only is the Isra in itself a miracle, because it is a miraculous, uh, it is a, a departure from the norms of the world, but upon his arrival, he described uh, the Bayt al uh, in detail, and he was not known to have ever, by the people who knew him intimately that he had ever gone there in his life. And people came and said that that is exactly what it's like. There is another report that he mentioned that there was a caravan that was such and such a distance away from Mecca on its way that he saw while he was traveling through the sky and they arrived on the exact day uh, that, he said, that he said they should be expected. Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدَلًا The word of your Lord has been completed in truth and justice. There is nothing that can change His words. He is the hearing and knowing, right? Also indicating the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, which cannot be replicated. وَعَدَ اللَّهِ حَقًّا وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا Now here is something important. It is a promise from Allah in truth, and who can be more truthful in speech than Allah? And Allah is declaring the truthfulness of Muhammad And Allah is telling us to follow Muhammad So, if a prophet is not truthful, then Allah has lied. Right? And a lie would be a contradiction in divinity. Right? It's not befitting of divinity to be involved in uh, misspeak and untruths. So if there is any untruth that is taking, part, uh, taking place on the part of the messenger, then that reflects badly on the one who sent that messenger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truthful in speech. Allah's choice is not arbitrary. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. If he is not the most qualified person to deliver the message, then that means that Allah has making, made a mistake. But he has chosen Muhammad to deliver his message. So that cannot be the, the case. وَإِذَا جَاءَتْهُمْ آيَاتٌ قَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ حَتَّى تُؤْتِيَ نُؤْتِيَ مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ رُسُلُ اللَّهِ رُسُلِ اللَّهِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ حَيْثُ يَجْعَلُ رِسَالَتِي Allah knows best with whom to place his message and he has chosen to place it with Muhammad He was known by the people of Mecca to be a Sadiq Al-Ameen So uh, not only is this a condition that we've seen from different perspectives that must be fulfilled by any prophet, the Prophet Muhammad himself والسلام, was known even by his enemies to be a Sadiq al Amin. And his truthfulness was even attested to by Abu Sufyan when he was still an unbeliever and he was uh, brought forth to speak in front of Hiraqal in uh, Syria uh, during a trade caravan and it was during the period of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and it was asked if he was ever treacherous or if he ever lied, and Abu Sufyan was put in a very difficult situation 
because other members of his caravan were told to, were, were, were forced to stand behind him and were told uh, by the men of Hirapal that if he says anything that's not true, immediately shout out that he's telling a lie. Abu Sufyan felt compelled to tell the truth. Uh, Do you have any questions on truthfulness? Sir? Um, how do we understand Garamat performed by people of other faiths? Thank you. There are different levels of breaking of the norm. The first level is the level of the miracle, the Marjiza, of a prophet. Okay? The Mu'ajiza of a Prophet. The Mu'ajiza of a Prophet comes at a time when someone, it, it's something that happens or transpires in the same, during the same period that someone is claiming to be delivering a message from God. And it always verifies the truthfulness of what they're saying. The second level is called a Karama. A Karama. And if anyone has an idea of how we can translate karama, but a karama is something that takes place on the hands of saints. Right? So saintly people who do not persist in minor sins uh, and are very close to God and in obedience to God, right? when the norms are broken for them to testify to the veracity and truthfulness of uh, the way that they're following is called a karama. The next level is called a ma'una. Now, you can't have a saint except for that saint is a scholar of sacred law. So there's no such thing as a saint, as a proper wali, right? Except that they're a scholar of sacred law. The next level is called a ma'una. The ma'una means, karama means uh, something uh, to honor someone. But if there's another way to describe miracle, right, without using that same term, then that we would use that for karama. The maruna is a support, right, or a help or an assistance. And the maruna is for a salih, a righteous or pious person, was not necessarily also a scholar, okay? But they're an upright, pious person, and it's where God helps them in difficult circumstances. And then you have something called istidraj, okay? Istidraj is when the norms are broken for someone who is not in harmony with Tawheed or sacred law in order to delude them and as a punishment cause them to move further away from God. Because if they think things are going right, well then they'll keep persisting in their Dalaa. That's a punishment. So that's istidraj. So if there were a true breaking of the norms on the part of people who are not monotheists and in harmony with the sacred law of Sayyidina Muhammad والسلام, we would consider that to be istidraj. <coughs> and finally there's an, something called ihana. And an ihana is a breaking of the norms for someone claiming, falsely claiming to be a prophet and it goes in the opposite direction. What happens is the opposite of what they wanted to prove. So it's as if God is making them look like a fool.
And that's what used to happen. And we'll say that. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So let us go join the prayer. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Malik, Yawm, Al-Din. We move on to the second of the four traits of prophecy, trustworthiness. Trustworthiness is basically that a prophet never perpetrates an act contrary to sacred law. Not something that is unlawful and not something that is disliked. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to follow the sacred law. And He's also commanded us to follow the prophets. So if the prophets did something that contradicted the sacred law, and Allah told us to follow the prophets, then Allah would have told us to follow to contradict his sacred law. And in that is a dilemma. Okay? In that is a disconnect and a contradiction. And a contradiction is a deep uh, flaw. And as we have seen in the preceding section, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of flaws. So, from that perspective, it is impossible for a prophet to contradict sacred law. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And they indeed sought to entice you from what we revealed to you, hoping that you might forge some other scripture in our name. Then they would have accepted you as a close friend. وَإِن كَانُوا لَيَفْتَنُونَكَ عَنِ الَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ لِتَفْتَرِيَ عَلَيْنَا غَيْرَهُ وَإِذَنْ لَتَّخَذُوكَ خَلِيلًا وَلَوْ لَا أَنْ ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِدْتَ تَرْكَنُوا إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا إِذَنْ لَا أَذَقْنَاكَ دِعْفَ الْحَيَاةِ وَضِعْفَ الْمَمَاتِ ثُمَّ لَا تَجِدُ لَكَ عَلَيْنَا نَصِيرًا Allah says, and they did seek to entice you, O Muhammad, from what we reveal to you, hoping that you might write a different scripture or change the scripture itself in our name. And then they would have accepted you if you had done that for them. And had we not strengthened you, you would almost have inclined to them just a little. In that case, we should have made you taste a double punishment in this life and in the next. Then you would have found none to protect you from us. Allah's Messenger والسلام, will stick to the letter of the law as it has been revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْدَ الْأَقَاوِيَ And if he had invented false sayings concerning us, we should have taken him by the right hand and then severed his life artery and none of you could have held us off from him. But he will deliver this message and stick to it in truth. And he can be trusted to stick to it. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا So if we have taken trustworthiness, amana, or infallibility, isma, to mean that the Prophet is not going to contradict the law, okay? And Allah is telling us to take him as an example, as we had said before, Right? Had it been otherwise, Allah would be telling us to take the example of someone who contradicts His law, which is a flaw. وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ So Allah here is telling us to follow the example of the Messenger. And Allah does not. وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا آفَنْتْ وَمَا آتَاكُمْ وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً قَالُوا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهَا آبَاءَنَا Okay. 
Wallahu amarna biha kul inna Allah la ya'mur bil fahsha. Allah doesn't command to do things that are iniquity or things that are flat foul, right? Such as contradicting the sacred law, contradicting the terms of Islamic ethics. And Allah has testified himself about himself in the Quran that he would never command such a thing. The Prophet والسلام, was always far from any type of thing, not even if it was makru, even if it was something that would be considered khilaf al awla, if it was something like contrary to what is preferred, right? Anything that was even bad adab, right? Even as a child, right? When he was. Uh, uh, playing with other kids one day it was very hot outside in the seerah of Ibn Hisham and the other kids were taking off their shirts right in order to cool down a little bit and he went to take off his shirt and he felt a smack on the back of his neck right and he felt that maybe he better not do that because it wasn't considered proper adab to run around without your shirt off right so even something as, as minimal as that the Prophet ﷺ was very, very modest about that. So that modesty is part of what will hold a person back from getting into think makruhat, getting into uh, things that are haram. No. So the Prophet ﷺ, one time, uh, the other kids said to him, have you ever seen a wedding party? And he said, uh, no, I've never seen a wedding party. They said, we've got to see a wedding party. And he said, okay, where do I see a wedding party? Well, so-and-so, this group is having a <laughs> wedding party, and if you go out with your goats or your sheep on the hillside in this area, you'll be able to look over into what is going on in the wedding party, and it's a, you know, a real good time. So the prophet went out and, uh, and sat, up all, sat up, and he was going to sit up at night and see the wedding party, but then he fell asleep. And they had their party and he didn't wake up until the sun was, was beating down on the next morning. So then he went back again and tried to do it again and he fell asleep, right? And then woke up the same time the next day and then he decided that, right, he'd had enough and it must not be uh, worth pursuing any further. So he was always pr protected from this even as a child and, uh, you know, we do have in narrations where the Prophet Muhammad has done certain actions that are considered makru when they are applied to us. So for example, it is makru to urinate standing up, right? Guys? Right? Of course. It's makru to urinate standing up, but the Prophet was known as an occasion to do that. It's a um, makru to eat or drink standing up, but the Prophet was known on a number of occasions to do that. Does anyone know why he did that on several occasions? Any idea? Okay, I think somebody over there. Uh, yes, bayan and the jawaz, and uh, also to demonstrate that it is permissible, but more so to demonstrate that it is not haram, but only makru, right? Because if it was haram, he never would have done it. But, to sh but because he had told people not to do it, okay, and uh, uh, it is, it is uh, so it's, it's a prohibition, and also it wasn't his habit, he did it once or twice, and that becomes the evidence that is makru. And then there's also the fact that, yes, he did it once or twice, but it was only once or twice in his entire lifetime, in his, his entire career as a prophet, right? And, that, and so, did the Prophet Muhammad actually do something that was makru? No. no. When he did it, it was wajib for him. It was fart because he's the legislator and he has to demonstrate legislation. Okay? But in our right, it is makru. I have a question. 
Yes. Suppose when you go to public rest restroom and stuff like that, what mm -hmm. do you think or stand in your name? Well, uh, the same thing as the Prophet Muhammad it, uh, what you want to determine is what is the base habit and custom of the person. If the base habit and custom of the person is to always sit down when relieving themselves, if they have circumstances, one, and one of the uh, rationales of sitting down is to avoid splashing, which means to avoid getting uh, filth on a person, if a person feels that they're in a situation where they have to do something different than is their habit in order to avoid getting filth on them, right? Then the situation is an exception to what is that person's sunnah, right? The sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Tayyib. That makes sense, right? Moving on to... With regard to the isma or infallibility of the Prophets, alayhim as salatu was salam, Shaykh al Islam Zakri al Ansari says that all of the Prophets are ma'asumun. We translate the word isma or ma'asum as infallibility and infallible. Here, ma'asum means to be protected from the haram and the makruh. So, the dominant position for Sunni Muslims, according to Shaykh al-Islam, Zakari al-Ansari, is that the prophets are infallible from committing even a minor sin by mistake or forgetfulness. فَلَا يَصْدُرُ عَنْهُمْ ذَنْبٌ لَا كَبِيرَةٌ وَلَا صَغِيرَةٌ So, no sin comes from them. Not a major sin, not a minor sin, not intentional, and not forget out of forgetfulness. فَلَا يَقِرُّ نَبِيُّنَا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Right? Our Prophet will not verify any person's doing something that is false. فَسُكُوتُهُ عَلَى الْفِعْلِ مُطْلَقًا دَلِيلُ الْجَوَازِ So when he's quiet and doesn't say anything, when someone does something in front of him, okay, that's evidence that that's permissible, that thing. Okay? Because as in his role as legislator, if it had been haram or it had been makru, he would have to speak up. So not only does he not ever perpetrate a major sin or a minor sin, right? He will never let anyone do such a thing in front of him without commentating. Moving on to the next attribute of prophecy, tabligh, or the conveyance of the message, the delivery of the message in full. What this means is that the prophets, they deliver everything that they have been commanded to, to deliver and they hold back nothing that they have been commanded to deliver. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا عَلَى الرَّسُولِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاهُ الْمُبِينَ The Messenger's duty is but to convey clearly. In another verse he says, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْفُرْقَانَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ لَيَكُونَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ نَذِيرًا Blessed is he who has sent down the criterion to his slave and that he may be a warner to the world. So that's the whole purpose. This is the mission, to deliver the message from God. And Allah says, Ya ayyuha nabiyyu, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness and a bringer of good news and a warner. 
and as a summoner to a law by his permission, and as a lamp that, got, that gives light, and, uh, uh, and announce to the believers the good news that they will have great favors from Allah. وَدَعِيًا إِلَى اللَّهِ بِإِذْنِهِ وَسِرَاجًا مُنِيرًا وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ فَضْلًا كَبِيرًا right. So one of the descriptions of the Prophet والسلام, is that he's a guiding lamp that gives guidance to people. That's the whole point of his message. So if you were to hold something back, what Allah has described him as would not be the case. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا And we have sent you but as a giver of good news and a warner to all people, not just some people, but most people do not know. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَنِينَ Right? He does not withhold the unseen. Right? He doesn't withhold anything of the truth that he is meant to deliver. And from another perspective, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالُوا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ اِكْتَتَبَهَا فَهِيَا تُمْلَى عَلَيْهِ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا Right? And they say that what he has brought are myths or legends of ancient people that he has put into writing, for they are dictated to him in the early morning and the evening قُلْ أَنزَلَهُ الَّذِي يَعْلَمُ السِّرَّ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Say that he has sent it down who knows the secrets of the heavens and the earth and he is clement and compassionate In the text of the Qur'an itself are mu'jizat Right? Are Miraculous statements that couldn't have even been known by the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. Am yaquluna taqawwalahu bal la yu'minun Or do they say uh, he has invented it? No, they have no faith. Let them produce a speech like it if indeed he has invented it, if, they, uh, if what they say is true. And if... The Prophet ﷺ was not delivering a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from other than himself, it wouldn't make sense that he's reproaching himself in the Quran. Right? Such as like the story of Zayd and Zainab, the Prophet ﷺ does not want to deliver the revelation that Allah has said that now that Zayd has left his wife, now you go marry the wife of your stepson, right, or your adopted son, right, and that is for the was for the sake of legislation to demonstrate that adopted sons are not part of the family. Adopted sons are not part of the family because that would create a problem in that people who are not of the bloodline are now being one attributed to a bloodline other than their own bloodline. And two, they are taking a share of the inheritance of the children of the bloodline and the other relatives of the bloodline, which would be a problem. So, to demonstrate that an adopted child is not legally part of the family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala broke it, that assumption once and for all by commanding the Prophet to marry the wife of his adopted child, which is something that uh, would never be tenable in that society uh, if someone did that to their own true son, or did, you know, marry the wife of his own true son. In Surah Al-Ahzab, and when you said to the one whom Allah has conferred favor, and you have conferred favor, so the one that you have helped, Keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. So Zayd said, should I divorce my wife? And the Prophet knew that for some, somehow he was supposed to marry Zainab, and he was actually supposed to say something about it, but instead of saying what Allah told him to say, he told Zayd to keep his wife. 
and you hide within yourself that which Allah was to bring to light, and you fear the people, whereas Allah had a better right that you should fear Him. So when Zayd had accomplished of her what he would, he, meaning that he had divorced her, we gave her to you in marriage, so that henceforth there be, may be no sin for believers in respect of wives of their adopted sons when the latter have accomplished of them what they would, meaning that they have ended the marriage. The commandment of Allah must be fulfilled. There is no reproach for the Prophet in what Allah has made his due. That was Allah's way with those who passed away of old, and the wish of Allah is certain to be fulfilled. It is the practice of those who delivered the messages of Allah and feared him, and feared none save Allah. Allah suffices as reckoner. Muhammad is not the father of any man among you, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets, and Allah has knowledge of all things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in his Quran, Al yawma akmeltu lakum dinakum. He has said, On this day I've completed for you your religion. He couldn't say that unless the Prophet had delivered in full. Otherwise that would be a contradiction in the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so there is evidence to uh, the, uh, the full conveyance of the message. And finally we have the finality of prophethood. There will be none who will deliver a message after Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah said in Surah Al-Ahzab, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Muhammad is not the father of any man among you, وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ He is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. Right? There will be none after him, and that is a tenet of faith. Are there any questions on prophecy before we continue? Afterwards, there were so many, uh, even in the country that were living, freedom of religion. There are many, there are, like there is one that we, that we know that we call them Ahmadis. And they say that we believe that Ghulam uh, al was also the messenger of God. He was the Nasir al So, in terms of considering them, like other people consider them as Muslims, so how do we deal with, with them? Well, first of all, the claim to prophecy after the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, is a clear contradiction to his statements, لا نبي بعدي There will be no prophet after me. A clear contradiction of the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran that he is the Khatim al-Anbiya Khatim al nabiyin and also to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum on this day I've completed you for uh, uh, completed for you your religion and Islam is the first religion that is sent to all people okay the message of Isa ibn Maryam was sent to the Jews right not to all of mankind Right. So different prophets were sent to specific peoples. Muhammad is the only one who made the claim to be sent to all people. And in that prophecy, in that revelation, was the completion of the deen sent to all people. So a claim of someone today, or after the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, to prophecy, is one, a contradiction to those teachings. And two those proposed prophets do not fulfill the condition of prophecy. They don't have an irreplicable revelation uh, and they don't have honesty, they don't have truthfulness, they don't have all of these other things. And if we look at their lives, we find that these claimants to prophecy fall terribly short. In the case of Musaylama, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept giving him his miracles in opposite of what he wanted to do and making a fool of him from one moment to the next. And in the case of uh, uh, others, right, such as Elijah Muhammad, had no prophecy, had no revelation. Okay, he had no revelation. 
And he also didn't uh, fulfill the conditions of Isma uh, terribly. And he also had contradictions with monotheism. Um, and Ghulam Ahmed, uh, Ghulam Ahmed would have had the same problem. Okay, so he has a claim to prophecy, yet no revelation. All right, uh, he fails in the conditions of prophecy, and um, and we said he has no revelation. He contradicts the teachings of the religion that he says that he avows to follow. And when asked about his, for example, the Khatim, right, he said that the Khatim of the Prophet means the adornment of the Prophets, like the jewel of the Prophets, because the Khatim is a ring, right? And a ring is something that is a, is a piece of jewelry that people wear, right, to be beautiful. So Muhammad had such a great status, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was the adornment or the beauty of the prophets because he was the ring, the khatim of the prophets. The problem with that is that khatim as ring is... fails as a proof when we look at the etymology of the word because the word khatim is the word that is used to describe what people used to press into the wax of a letter or an envelope or a seal, right, to show that this came from the king. And the kings and political authorities that had these seals used to then put them on a ring that could be kept on the finger for safekeeping. <coughs> so khatim really means what you impress into wax to seal a message, right? And only was later taken as, as uh, something to wear on the finger. So it fails there. So if we apply these rules of the conditions of prophecy, people can call anyone what they want. It's just words. But do they fulfill the conditions? And that's why Muslims are supposed to be people of meaning. But if Muslims choose not to be people of meaning, they become vulnerable to criticism from these directions that are only solved through meaning. Right? So, if you wanted to take that to its logical conclusion, if Muslims decide to not be people of meaning, then Muhammad والسلام, was not the last prophet. And many, many other things would be entailed if Muslims decide not to be people of meaning, right? Because then we're just people of words. Khafifun ala lisan wa khafifun fil mizan, right? And unfortunately, in so many places in the earth, we have, been, we have uh, ceased to be people of meaning. And every time you go to a program and they tell you, dumb it down, Keep it simple, right? Uh, that is a retreat. That is a tawalli an zahaf from being people of meaning. So there are some times we need it to be simple, but when you go to every single venue and they say, keep it simple, keep it simple, right? Well, if we're always keeping it simple with every single group of Muslims at every single occasion, then what is the result? Muslims become simple people, right? And Islam becomes a religion of simpletons, right? Um, we have two questions. The first question is about the, um, the second to last ayah on page 22. Um, the message is complete. When was that ayah sent down? And the second question? The second question is a little longer. It's about, um, does infallibility, infallibility or as one mean that the prophets are free from misjudgments about things in different situations? No. Isma means to be protected from perpetrating haram or makru. 
That's what Isma means. The question of Ta'bir and Nakhla, when Allah's Messenger والسلام, said, Entum edra bidunyakum, you have better knowledge of your dunya, when he told them to maybe not uh, make the, the cross pollinization operation on the palm trees, uh, and then they didn't bear fruit, right? And then he said, Well, you all know better what to do. Okay, or at the Battle of Bedr, when he asked, uh, when he, the person said to him, uh, now did you take up this position because this was revealed to you by God, or is this just a stratagem, a strategy of war? And he said, well, it's just a strategy of war. And he said, well, then this isn't a good strategy. Okay. There are two things here. One is, did the Prophet make a judgment that was a misjudgment? And two, did we learn anything from this? On the second count, we learn a great deal from both situations. Right? We learn that we should listen to advice, that even leaders should listen to advice. Okay. And on the first count, did the Prophet make a misjudgment? And there's also the judgment uh, to frown when uh, Ibn, Abi, uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum right, is, uh, is pulling at him and wants to talk to him when he's trying to talk to the leaders of Quraysh and he doesn't realize it. And the Prophet frowns and tells him later and turns back to the leaders of, Qur of Quraysh, giving preference to the Kufar over the Mu'minin. In all three circumstances, the Prophet's judgment was not makru. It's not makru to frown. It's not makru to tell someone, I'll talk to you later. Right? It's not makru to advise people when the advice isn't the best. Okay? It's not makru to choose a battle position. Okay? Uh, and all of those really don't amount to khilaf al-awla either. Even the frowning is not the hukum, the legal hukum of khilaf al-awla. However, there was a good strategy at better and a better strategy. Okay? Opinions about palm trees are opinions about palm trees. Okay, and uh, the Abbasa wa Tawalla, right, is not anything that is even makru or khilaf al awla. But, of course, there is a more handsome, and it is correct for the Prophet والسلام, to take the more handsome course of action. In all three circumstances, did we learn something? So, there are two ways to understand this. The first way is that you don't even have khilaf al-awla, let alone karahiyah, in these circumstances. The second way to understand it is, had this not happened, we would not have learned those lessons from the Prophet Muhammad So was it because he made a choice and there was a better choice? Or is it because Allah wanted us to learn something on purpose? It could go either way. Right? And you're right if you choose either of those two options. As far as on this day I have completed for you your religion, you know that this verse was revealed on the day of Arafah at the farewell pilgrimage and that it was a sign of the Prophet's end and it was also uh, a sign that the revelation had now reached its zenith and the Prophet would die three months and three days after that. It took place in the year 1,424 Hijra.
end, the Prophet ﷺ famously, uh, when he revealed that, Sayyidina Omar started crying. And the Prophet asked him, why are you crying, Omar? And he said, we used to be an increase, meaning that the revelation was constantly unfolding and we were getting new revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after this verse, we will now, there is nothing left but for us to be in decrease. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you're right. Any questions? How are we for time? 35 minutes. 35 minutes? Really? 35 minutes? Okay. Say it. Um, so the concept of the deed being complete, we live in a circumstance where many Muslims have this view of historical progress that things are kind of getting better mm -hmm. as technology and science move forward. So how do we reconcile these two poles in thought? Or some Muslims see Islam as something that needs to be reformed. Mm. Well, in the, uh, the Eid Khutbah and the, uh, the presentation I gave in Washington, D.C., we addressed how is it that we can say the deen is complete and still uh, it is relevant to every time and place 1,424 years later. Uh, so we talked about that in detail, how that works out. But to address the issue of increase in progress, let's also throw in not only is the deen complete, but the Prophet ﷺ saying, Khayru Qurun Karni. The best generation is my generation, and then those that follow, and then those that follow, and then those that follow. If we take it to its logical conclusion, it means that every subsequent generation is of less quality than the generation that came before it. And how can that be the case when technology has become better, medical care has become better, civil rights has become better, Right? And there are so many improvements, and we still consider ourselves to be getting better and better. In reality, if we take a look at it from a general perspective, there is an increase, but we have only increased in quantifiable things. Our increase is an increase in quantity. And of course, we've increased in various aspects of life, as well as the number of human beings, but also the uh, substance of human beings, the constitution of human beings and the human mind. But what we find is that as we increase in quantity, human beings become more and more aided by technology. Okay? People are getting more allergies than they used to get, right? Uh, we're getting more sicknesses than we used to have before. So there's an increase in quantifiable matters, but a decrease in quality. The quality of our knowledge is decreasing as, inf as, as, uh, as, as, uh, as generations grow while the quantity of the information that we have available is on the increase. But the quality of our ability to process that information as individual minds unaided by technology is on the severe, severe, severe decrease. People are having trouble communicating to one another. They're losing language because they're spending so much time with computers and other types of gadgetry and doing things online, getting everything accomplished online and through uh, phone uh, services where you push the one and you push the two if you want this option, right? You don't talk to human beings and now human beings are having a great difficulty actually expressing themselves to one another. This is something that's been noticed by uh, a, lot of, a lot of people. So in general what you have is an increase in quantity and a decrease in quality. So the people, the human beings that came before us, 
even amongst the kuffar, were superior in the past than the people that you have today. If we have 30 minutes left, then let us continue. So congratulations, you've now completed the chapter on prophecy, the Nubuat. And we begin the chapter of matters of faith. The reason why I've called this section matters of faith. This section is classically called the Sam'iyat. Okay, things that are heard. Meaning, through an oral transmission, those things that are heard and passed on orally. So we hear that transmission. And what it means is those things that we can only understand by being told about it through revelation by a prophet. There is no way for the intellect to grasp or arrive at the uh, circumstances and incidences and events of the unseen or the hereafter. We only know about those things because a prophet who has been uh, verified by miracles has told us about it. The reason why I call them matters of faith because we just have to have faith in the truth of the Prophet. But we've already arrived at the truthfulness of the Prophet through the miracles and so on and so forth. So we trust what the Prophet is telling us. Sayyid. So I've chosen this title, Matters of Faith. It should be known that Catholic philosophers, there used to be a time when there were only Catholic philosophers. Well, there are Greek Orthodox philosophers also. Okay, Nestorian philosophers, but there definitely weren't Protestant philosophers. Right? That starts in a particular period in European history. But the Catholic uh, theologians, they had chapters that were strictly based on logic, uh, and a, a great deal of this comes from their interaction with Arabic texts. And then they had, would have a chapter at the end called Matters of Faith because they contradicted logic. Now the difference between our matters of faith and their matters of faith is that our matters of faith don't contradict logic, they're just different than the regular norms of the physical world. But the norms of the physical world can easily change and that's not a logical contradiction. All right? Does everyone understand how that is? All right? You can imagine a world where things are different. Okay, you can imagine uh, a world where you have human beings and other beings called angels that can be seen by human beings and walk amongst human beings. Right? So that there, the existence of angels is not a logical uh, contradiction. You can imagine a world where when uh, people are put in their graves, they still have a different type of life and go through a questioning process while they're sitting in graves. One of the ways we know this is because we have movies that have angels and people in their graves and that type of thing and being questioned and so on and so forth, okay? And we don't think that there is some type of contradiction that makes the uh, movie untenable, okay? It's not your mind that says, that's not real, okay? It is just that that is make-believe because it's not what we witness with our five senses in this world, okay? If it had been a logical contradiction, you wouldn't have been able to show it on, uh, on a uh, movie screen, okay? You can't show a squared circle in a movie. You can't show a thing that exists and doesn't exist in the same mo moment, right, in a movie, okay? But you can do make-believe which could very well take place, just like it did in the movie, in an alternative universe. Okay? So that is one of the ways to differentiate between the two. However, to say that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1, well, that can't happen in an alternative universe. Okay? That is a logical contradiction. 
to say that an entity that has that is qadim and has no beginning and has no cause enters into a creation like something is entered into an envelope and then is surrounded by a creation that has a beginning and has an end well that's a logical contradiction it's a little bit complicated and difficult to understand but trust us it's a logical contradiction okay and maybe in advanced courses we'll get to the point where we chart that out that's not something that can be portrayed in a film all right uh, to say that something has no beginning could potentially have an end actually is a logical contradiction also okay and those are things that it's, that, that are discussed in Catholic uh, or uh, Christian matters of faith because they believe those things they believe that God can be surrounded by his creation they believe that God can die but somehow not die okay uh, they believe that God can have a physical portion, of, can be apportioned out and uh, have parts and some of those parts then separate and become something called the Son, which is a portion of God, right? Any Son is a portion of the Father, right? And if the Son then dies, well then part of God has died. These are all contradictions that cannot really happen in any possible world. The first of our matters of faith is the interworld or the Barzakh. The Barzakh is described as a state between death and the day of judgment. So the people of the interworld are not with the people of the dunya such that they might eat and drink, and they are not with the people of the hereafter such that they are rewarded for their uh, deeds with either Jannah or fire. Right? And there are three uh, aspects or states of the people of the interworld, or three things that happen to them. One is the squeezing of the grave, another is the questioning of the angels, and the third is the punishment or pleasure of the grave. The first of those aspects of the interworld, the squeezing of the grave, which is called Dagbat, al qabr and we ask Allah to save us from it. The Messenger والسلام, as reported by al Nasa'i said, Hada Ladi Taharraka Lahul Arsh, meaning Sa'id ibn Mu uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, wa futihat lahu abuabu sama, wa shahiduhu sabaruna alfan min al malaika, lakad dumma dhammatan thumma furrija anhu. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, who was one of the leaders of the Ansar, was martyred, I believe, at uh, Bani Qurayza. Okay, I think it was Bani Qurayza, or was it the Battle of Khandaq? All right. Um, and when he died, the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam, the throne shook. And the gates of paradise opened for him, and 70,000 angels bore witness to his martyrdom. But even he didn't escape the squeezing of the grave. And that's the point of this hadith. Even this person, whose death meant so much to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the people of the sama, even he didn't escape from the dhamma, the squeeze. He has just been squeezed by the grave and then released. So the squeezing of the grave is when the sides of the grave squeeze the person and release. Okay? This squeezing of the grave is metaphysical, not physical. Right? So if the grave physically collapses, right, 
or what have you, that's not the squeezing of the grave, that is what's called dishonoring the dead. All right? So when we're so careless that we build graves that collapse, all right, immediately, because we are so... Now, graves will collapse, all right? That's going to happen uh, every once in a while, even if you're trying your best. But when we're so careless or ignorant, all right, in the, 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 the nidam of Defen, right, that we build graves that are pretty much going to collapse every time, all right, that's different. But that's not the squeezing of the grave. The squeezing of the grave is something that happens that's metaphysical, all right? It's part of the experience, and we're not going to say that it's part of the torture or the pleasure, because there's no pleasure in the squeezing of the grave. Because some reports are that the squeezing of the grave is such that for everyone, it means that the rib cage, right, folds in on itself, right? And for some people, the squeezing will be more severe than others. In al Bayhaqi from Aisha, the Prophet says, Lil Qabri Dagtatun. There is a squeezing that takes place in the grave. Lokana Ahadun Naji and Minha Naja Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. If anyone were to escape it, it would have been Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. Okay? Ya Rabbi. So, to look at it a little bit further, the person, after he is put into his grave, he will be squeezed with a squeezing that no one knows its reality and how it happened, it's going to happen, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because no one has come back to tell us about it. And this daghta, لا ينجو منها أحد. No one will be free from it. سواء كان مؤمنا أم كافرا. Even if they're believer or a kafir or righteous or uh, what is the opposite of righteous? I mean, I should know, but huh? Not righteous. What? Righteous. Righteous. Ah. Tell you. A righteous or a Pagan. wicked, Pagan. wicked, right? Or a uh... Pagan. Pagan. okay. Well, I can al farq bain a salih wa talih, but the difference between a righteous person and a uh, a uh, word for it. It's escaping me at the moment. But the difference between a righteous... What? The difference between a righteous person and a licentious person is that the righteous person that used to stop at the limits and boundaries set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not transgress them, his squeezing of the grave will be once and it will be light and he'll, he'll be immediately released. But as for the licentious person, his will be very firm, and it will continue until the day of judgment, and Allah save us from that. Mm -hmm. yeah, Imam al-Nasai says that the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, okay, and it's the same hadith. Okay, the same hadith. Moving on to the questioning of the grave. Imam Bukhari and Muslim narrates from Anas ibn Malik, Verily when a slave is placed in his grave and his friends depart and he hears their footsteps as they leave, two angels come to him, sitting him upright, and ask him, What did you used to say about this man? Meaning the Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam. As for the believer, he will say, I testify that he is the slave of Allah and his messenger. It will be said to him, look at your place in the fire. Allah has exchanged it for you, a place in the garden, 
and he will behold both of those places. As for the hypocrite and the disbeliever, he will be asked, what did you used to say about this man? And he will say, I don't know. I used to say what the people used to say. It will be said, you didn't know and you didn't recite. Okay? And what is that in... Uh, He said, La dareta wa la talaita. Right? You didn't know and you didn't recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You didn't know and you didn't recite, and will be he will be struck with hammers of steel, with such a strike that his scream will be heard by all creatures same, save humans and jinn. Except for humans and jinn. Sayyid, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to save us to make us firm with his firm word in this life at the end, our last moment of living and the next life when we need it most in the grave to be firm on his firm word okay. and Allah can do that for us they said that Allah he be Aziz he could do that for every single person in this basement right now right, khalas Allah can do it do you have confidence in Allah? Right, I have confidence in Allah, no doubt. Say it. Moving on to the next. The torture and comfort of the grave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And do not consider those who have been killed in the way of Allah to be dead. Nay, indeed, they are alive, enjoying their sustenance with their Lord. So they are alive, but not with this type of life that we experience now, which is dunyawi life. They have a different type of life, which is the life of the grave. And in another verse, so that is for the shuhada, right? Who are alive with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, enjoying their experience. So there is a pleasure in the grave life. And in another circumstance, in Surah Al-Ghafir, they are presented to the fire morning and evening, and on the day of the appointed hour, the people of Pharaoh will be subjected to the severest of punishments. And naru yu'radun alayha ghuluwan wa ashiyya wa yawma takum sa'atu adkhilu ala fir'aun ashad al-adhab. And Allah says, We will cause them to taste the lesser torture, and which is understood to be the torture of the grave, before the greater torture, that perhaps they may return. وَجَاءَ فِي مَا رَوَى الْبُخَارِ Is he for the punishment before the death? No. So he's mentioned the, uh, the adab, adab al-adana, it means the, uh, the punishment before the qadr or the Before they die. Well, it could definitely be interpreted in terms of a punishment before death because perhaps that they will return or if they know that there will be a punishment in the grave perhaps they will return before they die. Okay, but I, I, we can check this, but I'm uh, fairly confident that it, it was, has been offered as a shahid for the punishment of, of the grave. <coughs> and in Bukhari, it has been revealed to me that you will be tried in your graves. Uhiya ilayya annakum tuftanuna fi kuburikum. Right? That there will be a tribulation in your grave. Now, Imam al qurtubi has said that from the comfort of the grave is that the grave be expanded for a person. 
and that a window be open for them that while they're in that expanded grave waiting for the day of judgment from that window they can look at the Jannah while they're in their grave and that the grave will be filled with a sweet and pleasant smell وَجَعَلَهُ رَوْضَةً مِنْ رِيَادُ الْجَنَّةِ It has also been said that it will be made a pasture of the pastures of paradise. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us and you that our graves be a pasture from the pastures of paradise and for those who you love and who loved you. وَتَنْوِيرُهُ حَتَّى يَغْضُوا كَالْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةُ الْبَدْرِ And that the grave will be lit up for some people until it has a brightness of the brightness of a, of a night of a full moon. And all of these are, of course, in a way that is appropriate to this interworld. The Prophet ﷺ at one point passed by two graves and said they are both being tortured, but their torture is not for any serious infraction or large infraction. Right? So they're receiving a torture of the grave for something that is not huge. And he sa said, no, it is huge. It is serious. As for one, he did not used to keep himself clean of urine. And the other, he used to engage in tail bearing. Right? Taking the theater of call and the gossip from one person to another. He then took a fresh palm frond and <coughs> tore it in half and placing one piece in each grave. And his companion said, Messenger of Allah, why have you done this? And he said, perhaps they may lighten their burden so long as they don't dry out. So he took the palm frond and he tore it in half so that there were two pieces. He put one piece in one grave and one piece on the other. Right? And they say, why did you do that? Well, this maybe will lighten their punishment so long as those palm fronds stay moist and don't dry out. Right? So that's why it is from the sunnah to take something, preferably something evergreen, so it will stay moist longer and put it on the graves. So that doesn't mean that you need to go out and try to find a palm frond here in New Jersey. Right? In New Jersey, what would you take? Right? Holly, for example. Put holly on the, the graves. Right? That would be a good thing to do. So someone had asked in the UK last week if it was okay to put flowers on the grave. And I said, if you want to put flowers on the grave, it's fine. But it doesn't necessarily make sense because Christians put flowers on the grave to make them feel better, to make themselves feel better, all right, and to honor the memory of the deceased. And some might put flowers on the grave because it's the habit in that society for people to go out to the graveyards and do something and you want your family member to keep up with the Joneses. So just like in the life, right? When the Joneses got a jet ski, we got to get a jet ski. When the Joneses built a deck on the back of their house, right? We had to build a deck on the back of our house, right? When the Joneses die and people put flowers on their grave, we have to show up and put flowers on our grave. So. So remember why the Christians do it, and ask yourself, why are you doing it? Because the Muslim tradition is for a completely different reason. And if the Muslim tradition is for a completely different reason, well then flowers are only helping as long as the flowers don't dry out, and they dry out fairly quickly. Right? So it helps, right? Putting a flower in the grave, does help, but it'd be better to see to look for something different than flowers that would last longer, because that's why the Prophet ﷺ chose the palm fronds. Question. Why? Because so long as they don't dry out. That was his illa. Traditionally, I've seen in Ethiopia they plant like some very smell. I mean, very not nice smell plant on the on the grave. 
not nice smell. No, it's very nice. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Like so those things you put in the tea or stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, like Rahan and they plant on the grape. Tradition. What, what is it called? Rahan. Rahan. Rayhan. Rayhan. Well, this hadith said that uh, Allah will fill the grave with Rayahin. So maybe it's from that perspective. Right? The other thing is, so long as it's got moisture in it, so long as it's alive, right, it's going to be making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that might relieve some of the discomfort of the grave. So, you know, if people are keeping it growing or something like that, well, then that's a good thing. In, uh, in Damascus, they have something uh, that they put on that is an evergreen, but it's like a frond, it's, it's like a combination of a holly and a fern, right, with like small little, little leaves on it. They go out on Eid and do that. No. Imam at Tirmidhi narrates from Abu Huraira that the Messenger والسلام, said, Once the deceased is placed in his grave, two black, blue eyed angels, one named Munkar and the other Nakir, come to him. Tayyip. In another narration from Abu Dawood, after the Prophet وسلم, had completed a burial, he would stand over the grave and say, Seek forgiveness for your brother and ask for him resolve, because right now he is being questioned. He used to say, Astaghfiru li akhikum wa salu lahu bit tathbiti fa innahu al ana yus'al. He is right now being asked. Right? And from this comes the I the tradition of the telqeen at the grave, because the person in the grave can hear, right? So you remind him of what he is supposed to say. Ya Rabbi, Allahumma ghfir li hayyina wa mayyitina wa amwatina. And Muslim from Barra ibn Azib narrates from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ That Allah makes firm those who believe with a firm word. It was revealed with regard to the punishment of the grave. يُقَالُ لَهُ مَنْ رَبُّكِ It will be said to him, Who is your Lord? And he will say, My Lord is Allah. And my Prophet is Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. فَذَلَكَ قَوْلُهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ And that is, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ And We'll stop here at the first and second sounding of the horn, inshaAllah. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, barakallahu feekum, ahsanallahu alaykum.